We're here. Let me introduce David Ng. Um, I've known David for about 10 years. He's um, actually spoken in this course uh, for uh, at least the last five or six years with a lecture on, on service systems, uh, service systems from a, a service system science and de development approach. So the understanding the, uh, the theory, the relationship to organizations, the, the prevailing concepts in service systems <coughs> thinking, and uh, one of the one of the applications of, of of service systems in this course is is relating the understanding of complex service systems to service design, the uh, design development of service systems and organizations and and, uh, um, and policies and complex systems that you may be working with in your you know, your own projects and from here. So we don't have a strong core of service design even in this program, and so this is one of the, even though uh, I'll, I'll, I think a lot of the talk relates to uh, organizational concepts that can apply across a lot of different applications, it's not strictly service systems. But, uh, so David has uh, tailored his talk for, you know, for this course, for this year, and uh, uh, so with, and, and uh, a couple of other things about David Ng, he's, He's the uh, past president of the International Society of System Sciences, an organization to which I belong as well. We usually usually attend the same ones or try to figure out if this is going to be like a good year or have something to present. And, and uh, we, uh, we participated in ISSS, uh, David, for maybe well over 15 years or perhaps 20 years, um, maybe for a little less than that. Uh, David is the founder, I'm kind of a co-founder and supporter of the Systems Thinking Ontario Group, which meets every third Wednesday, so you know about Design with Dialogue and the Systems Thinking Ontario uh, meet, is every third Wednesday, usually in Lambert Lounge, over 100 McCall. Uh, David had a book launch um, for the 500 page or so <laughs> book that, that uh, came from his PhD work at Alto University. Um, David, um, now that's, as, as you say, that's probably more readable. I mean, rather than getting it printed out, um, it's probably good to download it as, I mean, a PDF or EPUB or a, an ebook. It's, it's readable in the sections of interest and, and actually quite well written because I've been kind of working my way through it. But he had a, a book launch, um, the last Systems Thinking Ontario, just two weeks ago and very well attended in the auditorium of, uh, uh, at OCAD. And so, so a, lot, David, David, a lot of David's work on open source, uh, open source development and, and pri um, private development of open source uh, concepts, open source software has been developed in his PhD and as well as uh, theory of uh, pattern language. Um, pattern languages, uh, or a pattern language for service service systems applications. So, um, so because of your commitment to open source, mo almost all of David's work is available at the time he's working on it. And so if you're interested in going further, I'm sure you'll get plenty of other references and, and opportunities to access uh, uh, soon to be Dr. David Davis' work. So with that, let me turn it over to you and I'll be back at the break. Okay, thank you. Um, so the slides are available, uh, coevolving.com slash commons slash publications, and you probably want to uh, actually have it. If you, you can go download it or you can just watch it on the, on the web page. Uh, this is actually a brand new talk. Um, I, I'm a regular here. Actually, we're teaching a class at uh, University of Toronto um, for uh, six weeks in, in January and February. So um, my talks get... Uh, shaped by what I'm doing now. So every time I give a talk, it's a new talk. And this one is a really new talk because of all the stuff that's been going on. Uh, so this talk is called Architecting for Wicked Messes. Um, I'll explain all of that. And it's towards an affordance language for service systems. And I've been working on that for three years. And uh, actually using the words affordance language is actually something new. So um, you'll see some coming your way. So the agenda, I'm going to cover five things, um, and uh, we'll have to watch time. I'm going to go over stuff rather quickly, and there's a lot in the slides. I'm actually not going to go through every slide. I'm not going to go, and actually, in 
there's two versions in the uh, LibreOffice slide deck. One is the one I'm actually projecting, which has, uh, um, has slides hidden. Uh, the other one you can actually look at, it's got all the hidden slides out uh, because there's even more behind that. But I decided to give this talk because we're starting to move towards, uh, there's been a lot of interest recently discussing wicked problems again. And what I've discovered is that I'm old enough now that it's like I actually know what they were, and some people don't know what they were. It's like, oh, okay. So, uh, so I'm going to give this talk um, tracing the way back through uh, and moving towards the pattern language research that I've been doing. So there's five ideas uh, there, and within each of the five ideas, there's five parts. And so what I really want to do is make sure I've covered each of the five by five, and the slides are kind of on the way um, to uh, doing that. So the first idea, designing for tame problems versus architecting for wicked messes. Um, we'll get into discussing a little bit about what a wicked problem is and why it uh, should be approached. And, and for you, doing, as, you're, as you're doing your um, major research projects, uh, the question you'll have to ask yourself is, are you working on a wicked problem? And if you're doing so, then I'll show you be working the way you're working. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about analyzing the complicated versus synthesizing the complex. And that's <coughs> using systems terms, and so I uh, want to make sure everyone understands what all those words mean. Uh, thirdly, the idea of unfreeze, change, freeze, um, and uh, versus co-responsive movement. Uh, this is work that I've been doing um, in my dissertation towards uh, trying to reframe the way that I look at systems um, through ecological anthropology. And so um, this talk is not a talk I could have given even two, three years ago uh, because of there's been so much change. Uh, number four, planning, which is teleology versus programming, which is teleonomy. People may have heard of teleology, they probably will not have heard of teleonomy. It's actually around, just have to find it. Um, and then the fifth one, which is getting us towards the service science, uh, service systems work, is looking at industrial value change versus co-producing offerings. So we'll start off with the first one. Um, okay, I'm gonna make these five statements, then I'm gonna kind of roam through them. So firstly, a tame problem is complicated, a wicked problem is complex. And so, I don't know what all those words mean, or I'll try to make sure you understand that. Uh, if you're going to approach a wicked problem or a wicked mess, I prefer the word mess, uh, we'll start getting the problem to see why, um, you could do it by resolving to the prior, going backwards, solving for the optimal, dissolving to eliminate, or abs absolving potentially, um, and that may be relying on nature. And so if you're doing a research project and actually coming up with some result, you can ask yourself, which of these are you doing? Um, the C, I uh, want to talk about all architecture is design, but not all design is architecture, and that influences the talk. Um, that brings me to the idea of problem solving, solving versus problem seeking. And then I'll go back in through some of the research that led to that, which is on, uh, has led to kind of a fork through uh, issues and argumentation versus the work on acquiring systems. So, has anyone read the Rattel and Weber 1973 dilemmas? Okay, one person. Okay, how many people have heard of wicked problems? Okay, what's a wicked problem then? It's a problem like so big or so complex that it can't be tackled or it should be tackled in like a normal way. Okay, so, so here's the assignment. Everyone, you'll have it on the slides, the breakdown, but if everyone says they're working on a wicked problem and they haven't read the original article, you've got a problem. Because um, a lot of people are saying that uh, they, they're trying to work on wicked problems and, um, and then it's like, okay, you actually didn't read the article because any of the things that you're doing says you can't do that with a wicked problem. So what he talks about here are societal problems and they're different from the type of scientists and engineers use. And so you end up with a, an issue about um, does science help you or not? Does science help you with a wicked problem? Well, okay, well what do scientists do? Uh, a lot of the wicked problems um, uh, are of the type that science actually doesn't help. So Riddle actually makes a distinction between what he calls tame problems and wicked problems. And the tame problem has a solution. 
The wicked problem does not have a solution. And so there are 10 distinguishing properties, um, and on the next two pages are, here they are. I'm not going to go through all of them, but the first one, let's do the first one. Um, with a chain problem, an exhaustive formulation can be stated containing all the information needed for understanding and solving the problem. So that's like you know doing math homework or something like that. You're given a problem and there is an answer. As opposed to there's no definitive formulation of wicked problem. If you can't define the problem, it's an ill-defined problem, how are you going to solve something that you can't define? So there's, there's the first thing. Um, number two, there are criteria that tell you when or, I might say typo, tell you when or a solution, uh, when the or a solution has been found. So if you actually know what you're looking for, you can go find it, it's a tame problem. Wicked problems have no stopping rule. So you may actually have come to a better place, but how do you know you're actually in a better place? And is that better place good enough, or do you keep going? So if you go through all of these, um, uh, there's, there's various ones. Number four, uh, one can determine on the spot how good a solution attempt has been, as opposed to there's no immediate and no ultimate test of a solution to a wicked problem. Um, I think you can't test it. Well, science relies on testing, isn't it? So you build a hypothesis and you test it. Well, if that doesn't help you, then now you've got a problem. Um, six, there are criteria which enable proof that all solutions have been identified and considered. So before you go out, you kind of enumerate, you say, okay, these are all different alternatives, all different ways of going. Wicked problems do not have an enumerable or exhaustively describable set of potential solutions, nor are they well described. Uh, below it, every wicked problem is essentially unique. Okay, so every time you come and do something, uh, it's different. How is that going to work then? Um, and this, this is where science gets into trouble. Now, I've been doing a lot of work recently between uh, descriptive theory and normative theory. I'll get into a little bit of that later. But science requires data. And the assumption is that the data yesterday is as good as the data today, as good as the data tomorrow. But if every wicked problem is unique, then science kind of breaks down because it's like, well, it's unique. So the fact that data yesterday was irrelevant today. The last one, number 10. Science is not blamed for postulating hypotheses that are later refuted. So people like to think of that science is factual and you can actually rely on it. But uh, the way that science actually works, if you talk about the sociology of science, is that every scientist has their own pet theory and they speak and they create their theory and then sometimes the theory is wrong and it gets disproved. So you go from Newton to Einstein, right? All of a sudden everything changes. The social planner has no right to be wrong with a wicked problem. <coughs> the planners are liable for the consequence of the action they generate. Okay, so you can't say, well, it seemed like the right solution yesterday and that's why I recommend it. And now it's like, well, sorry, sorry, it's not good enough because you're still on the hook, even though science might have protected you before. Russell Acoff calls a wicked problem mess or problematique. Um, and he says optimal solution on model is not optimal solution for a problem unless the, the perfect representation. But in the big type here, he says, what the French call a problematique and I call a mess, a complex and highly dynamic system of interacting problems. So that's why I prefer to use, trying to use the term wicked mess as opposed to wicked problems. At least it's clear because we have problems and problems. We have problems you can solve, problems you can't. It's better to say it's a mess. Um, so one of the ideas behind a mess is that the sum of the optimal solutions to each component problem because they're separately is not optimal solution to the mess. So partial solutions don't help. And it requires more than problem solving. It requires synthesis, design, and invention, which is all part of what this program should be about. OK, so how are you going to deal with the mess? Um, Acoff comes and says there's uh, four ways to do it. Resolving, and I, I actually made some changes here, but essentially one idea is resolving to a prior. So you had something that worked before go back to what worked before. Okay, that's resolving the problem. Solving the problem, solving for an optimal. You can work your way up through 
um, the optimal, and you, know, like you can mathematically prove it. But the problem they have with the optimal is that conditions change. And one of the things about science is that science is normally universal. It is not conditional. So they don't, they don't take into account a lot of things that change in the world. They simplify things. Um, what Acock tried to do with his, his theories is to do uh, what he calls uh, dissolving the problem. Um, and that eliminates the problem. Um, so the typical uh, example we talk about dissolving a problem, if you have children, you have two children, they're fighting over a toy. Okay, so how would you solve this problem? One would be resolving your prior. Well, whoever had the toy 10 minutes ago gets to keep the toy. Um, solving for the optimal. Okay, well, we'll try to try to try negotiate with the two children that they can share it and take turns, something like that. It may or may not work. Dissolving to eliminate. You take away the toy. Now you have no problem because you're, you've, you've taken away uh, the reason for the conflict. Um, there's also one that Acoff uh, says that uh, we generally don't look at, but actually we should look at it more seriously, which is at solving, which is hoping the problem goes away. Uh, now, if you do a good dis dissolution, if you dissolve a mess in a previous time, what you should be able to do is you should have a, si a system that self-corrects. If it's a good design, then the system would actually come around and fix itself eventually, right? Um, if it's a bad design, a bad dissolution, then you're going to end up with a resolution or uh, a, sol a solution that uh, doesn't persist. But there's always opportunity to hope that things will come around. And sometimes the best action is no action. If I come and I'm going to flip over now. This moves off, um, off uh, uh, Russ Acoff's work towards Timothy Allen's work. Um, Timothy Allen is an ecologist. Um, and he's wrote this, written this book called Supply Side Sustainability. So now we're talking about messes that happen in the environment and in ecology. Um, and uh, I don't know if that slides in, in the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, so what he does on this is, is the idea behind supply side sustainability is that you manage the context rather than managing the system. I'll get into more of, of what that means when we start getting the system description. But as an example of managing productive systems rather than, than for their outputs. And so we're talking about sustainability. He says, well, you know, everyone thinks that they should be using less energy. And so you turn down the temperature in, in your house. But that makes you uncomfortable. And is that really dealing with the problem? You're not dealing with the system. You're just dealing with the output. So that's not really a systems thing. Uh, managing a system by context in the context of containing coal, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, number three, identify what dysfunctional systems lack and supply only that. So is it possible to have systems that design themselves or take care of themselves as part of their nature to be self-repairing? Um, deploy ecological process to, to subsidize management efforts rather than conversely. And so in this case, you're using what is available in nature already. Now, when I say nature, I don't just mean ecology. It could also be human nature. So as an example, if you assume that people are greedy, are you going to take advantage of that? Because people will be greedy. And it's like, OK, well, if you're going to, we could actually think that's going to be part of human nature that people are going to be greedy. And so take care of that. Um, and then last one, understand the problems of diminishing returns to problem solving. Uh, and diminishing returns um, is an issue that comes with um, uh, complexity and complicatedness, which I'll get into a little bit later. For people catching up, the slides are at coevolving.com slash commons slash publications. Okay. So what do we mean by complexity? Um, now, Peter and I are part of the group in, in the system sciences with, that has a heritage group to like, what, the 60... 3rd, 64th annual meeting. So it's actually quite old. A lot of this reading you do on complex adaptive systems only dates back into the 1990s. And uh, there, there's a lot of confusion uh, between complex thinking and what I would say is called network thinking. So this is an article by uh, Melanie Mitchell, who was at Santa Fe Institute. And she writes things like, there is no generally accepted formal definition of a complex system. Okay, well, the, the history of the Santa Fe Institute was 
you had um, physicists that are interested in, in systems and they got money primarily from Citibank um, because they're interested in trying to figure out how to manage chaos or deal with chaos. Um, so um, they're dealing essentially in physics. Anyway, so um, no generally accepted definition. Uh, emergent complex behavior is tougher to define. So we've used the term emergence before. Most people use the term wrong. Um, traditionally, the more mathematically oriented sciences like physics, chemistry, and math they concentrate on simpler models that are more tractable to mathematics. This is the um, solving the uh, problem under the lamppost. You've heard of this, the drunkard always clings to the lamppost and he's lost his keys. So drunkard's lost his keys. He's looking under the lamppost and he asks, why are you looking under the lamppost? And so, where, did you lose your keys here? He said, no, I lost my keys over there in the dark. Why are you looking over here under the lamppost? Because the light's better here. So this is a case where they're using that sort of thinking. We can solve these problems. And so let's work on the problems that we can solve because the problems we can't solve, we can't solve. Well, we just went through all this about wicked mess. So if a wicked mess you can't solve, does that mean you leave it alone? No, there are a lot of wicked messes that we want to do something better on. Uh, so we need to work on them, but we may not work on them in the same way that uh, mathematicians do. Let's do a little flip here. Um, there's a, a, a body of work through um, coming down from a scientist named Robert Rosen, uh, and he'll come in and out here. But how about if we do it this way, and we say that complicated systems are rare, uh, complex systems are the norm. So now you get to the question, well, what do you mean from complicated versus complex? So the uh, simple explanation, simple metaphor for complicated is an egg. You have the egg yolk and you have the egg white. You can separate them out. Complex is beating the egg. Now you get the yolk and the white mixed together. Try to separate out the egg yolk and the white after it's been beaten. That is a complex. There are recipes that call for you cooking all of your um, yolks one way and then cooking all your whites another way and then combining them. That's a complicated solution. Um, the alternative is to have the complex solution and say, look, okay, uh, I, got a, I got all these cracked eggs and I'm feeding them and I'll deal with the complexity. But the, the, the way that we talk about um, complexity, people think that, they, that complexity is a bad thing Complexity is not a good or bad thing. It's just a description of being a beating egg. Uh, another way of describing complexity would be to talk about water. So water is a complex. You have, we know now from physics that it's com from chemistry, it's composed of hydrogen and oxygen. Okay, so there are properties of hydrogen, there are properties of oxygen, and if you look for the property of wetness, the property of wetness is not in either hydrogen or oxygen. The property of wetness is in the complex of water. So if you are standing and looking at it from the perspective <coughs> of, uh, of hydrogen and oxygen and looking for the wetness of water, wetness is an emergent property of the whole that comes out. That's the correct use of the word emergent because you can't see it from the hydrogen or the oxygen. And also, going from hydrogen to oxygen to water is possible. Going from water to hydrogen to oxygen is possible, but it's difficult. OK. I've been using the word architecting, um, and I've got to differentiate it from designing. Um, on the left is a description by Grady Booch, who's a uh, distinguished engineer at IBM. Um, and, and so he talks about design in two ways. A structure, behavior, a system that resolves a, um, a force or some forces on that system when you do a noun. Um, this actually comes from a pattern language definition, which I'll get into later, uh, with forces. Then you have the verb, which is the design, which is making the decisions that do that. And he says that all architecture is design, but not all design is architecture. So how would differentiate that? Uh, one way of doing that, up at the top, I usually think about architectural thinking as shaping the structure of the environment. So you have the system, you have the environment, 
You can work on the system or you can work on the environment, the environment is part of the context. And so we can work on the context as opposed to working on the system itself. Design, design thinking, you usually do the divergent steps. Uh, this is the uh, uh, Tim Brown idea type of definition. Uh, creating choices, divergent steps on making choices. But for me, architectural thinking is more powerful because what you're doing is you're making a lot of the background decisions that impact the way the design is done. So one way of describing architecting would be I'm dividing up the space and then designing would be filling in the space. So when you're dividing up the space, are you filling up the space? Well, kind of, but when you're filling up the space, you're dividing up the space, well, less so. So you do kind of architecting at a different level. Now, architecting, you can look at this in two ways, um, and this is uh, Tim Ingold's work. Um, it's got this book called Temporality of the Landscape, because we tend to think about things in the physical world and we often describe things like landscape. So the landscape is the world, to know the people who dwell in it, who have a place and journey along the path connecting them. But it says, maybe we should consider time instead. Uh, doesn't mean that, that space doesn't exist, but we consider time. Then we have an idea of cascade, where people are working together and doing something as processes over time. So when you're architecting, you're not just architecting necessarily landscape, but you could be architecting the tasktscape of how people are working. You're architecting both space and time. In 1969, in the architecture community, they had this idea of problem seeking, um, and problem seeking was differentiated from problem solving. This is before we started getting into all the stuff on solution being a problem with definition. Uh, but architects, have the idea essentially uh, of problem seeking versus problem solving. So uh, they say design is problem solving and programming, which is architecture, architectural programming, <laughs> is problem seeking. So you can hear about the architects who won't take on projects because they're too easy. So architects like those challenging problems, like you know, they want to build on the side of a mountain so something will fall off, or, it's, or they want a body of water where you know, it's going to be dry, these sorts of things. And so we get into the question of what problem seeking versus problem solving. Um, I prefer to work on the problem seeking issues. Um, if you're doing it right, then you may not be working underneath the lamppost. You, you, you may actually so I find it's worth, worth solving a problem you weren't asked to work on. Riddle, back to wicked problems. Now we actually did this work before he, um, he uh, wrote the paper on wicked problems. Um, and so he created what was called issue-based information systems. Um, and what he did was try to identify, uh, guide the identification, the structuring, and the settling of issues. And so you can actually find software um, that will do this um, and help you map this stuff out. It's open source, you can go down to Compendium and, uh, and work on it. Um, but the, the elements of the system are topics, um, so if you have some, something like an election that you can work on. Uh, issues, uh, the positions that people take. Questions of fact, or is it true or not true? Uh, positions, the arguments, and then model problems, the things that, the way they, they approach it. So if you had a wicked problem, this is the way that um, Riddle would have suggested working on it. And he, he was doing this um, in California, Berkeley, uh, in the architecture program. However, um, I'll come back to you. This, this presentation is looping back on itself. Um, there's another way to approach it would be to look at it uh, for, as a design of acquiring systems. An acquiring system is a way of knowing human beings. The question essentially is, if we're going to do this problem seeking, which is a question, looking for questions, not for answers, um, how do we know? How do we know what the question is? And so there's four acquiring systems here, the fifth one on the next page. But the first way of knowing is an inductive consensual acquiring system. Um, typically, th this is pretty popular, which is uh, you know, majority rules. Uh, or you take a poll. And so um, how do you know, uh, the, the, way, the way that acquiring systems work is you have information in the beginning and you have an output at the end. So how do you guarantee that the system is working properly? In the case of an acquiring system, agreement or consensus is the reason, is, is how you actually know that 
is true. So the example would be, if everyone in this world, has anyone seen the whole world and seen the world is round? No. You think the world is flat? Everyone in the world says the world, the world is flat? The world is flat. That is inductive consensual, because everyone says the world is flat, so therefore the world must be flat. The second way, an analytic deductive inquiry system um, is a, uh, it's like a scorecard. That's the best way of describing it. So if you're trying to find the best man for the job, typically they say, okay, we need a new CEO. Uh, what, what should we do? Okay, well, we need someone with leadership skills, you know, uh, so create a scorecard. So 40% leadership skills, you know, 30% industry, um, industry knowledge. Uh, you go kind of go down and create a scorecard. And then you score all the candidates. Well, how do you know that you're hiring the best person? Oh, they got the highest score. So that's pretty standard. The third way is a multiple realities inquiry system, which is representations. When you get into this, uh, both the first two are objective ways of knowing. You can actually uh, go and do a, a for, for the uh, inductive consensual inquiry system, the first way, you can actually go and take a poll or do a statistics or, you know, you can actually do the math and you can figure out that uh, this objective answer. And you can do that also with scorecard in the analytic deductive. When you get to the multiple realities acquiring system, what this says is that the model and the data are an inseparable whole. And so now you're inside someone's head. So the way I know systems is different from the way that Peter knows systems because we, we have different data and we have different ways of processing it. Um, so what happens here is that you get disciplinary views. Uh, for example, you look at a drug problem. Well, is it, how do you look at the drug problem? Is it a youth problem? Is it a control problem? Is it a policing problem? And so if you went to each one of the people, if you went to the police and asked them how to handle the drug problem, and you went to medical professionals, you asked them how to handle the drug problem, you get two different answers. And there's not one that's right or wrong because it depends on the way they put their data together inside their heads. Dialectic inquiry system, which is the fourth way of knowing, uh, is a dialectic where one side argues black and the other side argues white. Now in Canada, we should actually be pretty comfortable with this. Everyone took civics. And there's parliament. And parliament is supposed to be the government and the opposition. What is the purpose of the opposition? The purpose of the opposition is to oppose. Okay, does, wait a minute. Doesn't that mean that the liberals are usually on the left and the conservatives are usually on the right? Uh, that's not the way our system works. The way our system works is that if the government goes to the right, then the opposition has to go to the left and debate the other side. The purpose is in the debate. And the guarantor there is conflict. You need someone arguing black and you need someone arguing white. Because it, you can't see the gray unless you have people actually really defending their positions. Now one of the things about this is that when you have a dialectic, uh, if it's designed properly, it's someone outside the system that actually observes. So the person that is actually doing the debating, the person that's taking the black position or the white position, actually doesn't really learn anything. It's the person that observes on the outside that learns. So can we create an inquiring system that sweeps in all of the above? And so yes, there's a systems approach um, that takes all of it into account. Um, and the guarantor here is progress. So in effect, it's a multiple person dialectic where everyone gets to be an observer, everyone gets to be a dialectic pole, and you rotate around. And how do you know when you're done? You do this through the measurement of progress. You decide what progress is before you start. So if progress is going to be um, customer satisfaction, okay, how do we increase customer satisfaction? Then you debate around that and uh, you have customers come in, you have uh, manufacturing people come in, you have marketing people, they all come and they debate in different ways and then they each get a position and then you, you learn by going around everyone getting the opportunity to observe.
Okay. I'm going to pause now for questions because now everyone's married. Uh, again, the slides are colon.com slash common slash publications. So we covered a, a tame problem is complicated, a wicked problem is complex. Kind of got the idea about that? Yes, no? Okay, just generally, you don't have to be an expert, I'm just trying to get you primed here. Resolving to the briar, solving to the uh, optimal, dissolve to eliminate, and absolving potentially to nature. Okay, got that. All architecture is designed, but not all design is architecture. Understand that. Uh, problem solving versus problem seeking. And then the issues of the argumentation, which is the riddle approach, and opposed to the inquiring system, which is the church run approach. Okay. Everyone needs to rest now, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, this is, uh, this is not usually where I have started my, um, my presentations. Um, I'm gonna, I'm, the next section is actually going to cover the stuff I normally cover first. Um, because I'm doing this as a, uh, a, uh, a new way of presenting. Um, so, we're going to talk about analyzing the complicated versus synthesizing the complex, which is the basics of systems thinking and what system thinking is. Uh, first thing, we'll talk about parts, holes, and their relations, which is the way I define it. We'll talk about synthesis before analysis, um, facilitating versus participating. Now, this actually happened while I was teaching the University of Toronto class, because we were, that was actually a methods class, and, and that was one of the things that we were having stumbling on, was that some methods are participative and other ones are not. Um, then, in designing a system, we'll talk about high gain, which creates efficiency, uh, and, uh, or may create collapse. Or it's a low gain system, which is um, related to sustainability. And with that, we'll get to uh, complicating or complexifying or decomplicating and decomplexifying. So, the one definition I have published um, this is in the System Research Behavioral Science. System thinking is a perspective on parts, holes, and their relations. That's a pretty simple definition. And it's pretty universal. So system thinking happens, uh, it's common across all cultures. It's, it's, it translates in multiple languages. Um, and there are three basic ideas that you can use uh, to kind of check yourself, make sure you've understood it. So one is function. Function is contribution of the part to the whole. Okay? Um, and we tend to call, um, when it's a non-living thing, we call it a function. When it is a living person, so if you're an organization, you know, what is that person's function? You have to say, no, actually, what's that person's role? You tend to use that language. Structure is an arrangement in space, so you have two parts, and they can be arranged in certain ways. Process is an arrangement in time. So there's the cleanest definition of the basic systems ideas. Skill testing question. Which comes first, structure or process? They happen at the same time. <laughs> you want to take that one off? Which comes <laughs> first, structure or process? Structure. Structure? Anyone else? I was going to say process. I don't know why. I was going to say process too. Just because the structure probably is based. So it took me um, eight years in the systems community before I was walking with the former, the former president. I asked him, uh, which comes first structure process? And he says, it's obvious, isn't it? I said, no. Um, it turns out the process comes before, before structure. Because time is a one-way arrow based off the second law of thermodynamics. So things go from order to disorder, entropy. Uh, so structure is the slowest changing process ever. If you are looking at a mountain, to us a mountain is structure rather than process, but the mountain also changes. It just we can't see it on the scale we're working on. Okay. So that's a trick. Now, here's another thing. System thinking of perspective on holes, parts, and their relations. Okay, so we did the holes, we did the part, part, we did the part hole. How about the whole whole relationship? Can you have a whole, whole relationship? Yeah. You can have a whole, whole relationship, and we need to cover those as well. 
we'll yeah, come back to it. We haven't covered that yet, right? They haven't covered it yet. I'll come back to it in a minute. But serious about the definition. <laughs> I think one thing about process that's tricky when you, if you're saying that it starts first, which I get, um, at the same time, I kind of feel like we're so evolved as a society and physically on the planet that there, there is no empty space where structure doesn't exist, so it's sort of hard to conceive of a process happening in a context where there isn't already prior structure. It, it's, it's a definitional issue, and, and, th and one of the reasons for emphasizing process is that when you see drawings like this, people automatically think that's not over time. Mm -hmm. uh, thinking and processes is the biggest change. This, this is the change I've had. So the discussion about mm -hmm. uh, about landscape versus taskscape, yeah. that's less than two years I've been working on that. I've been working on systems since 1998. Mm -hmm. And so it took me a while to get around the idea of, oh, okay, taskscape. Well, that's perfectly a reasonable thing. And actually, taskscape actually makes a lot more sense in a lot of cases because if you have all the parts and you sequence them wrong, then they don't work. Yeah. So sequencing matters. Okay, ACOS definition of what I call authentic system thinking. Um, the reason I say authentic system thinking is that you end up at a party, you talk to people, they say, oh, what do you do? Oh, I do teaching system thinking. They go, oh, yeah, I'm a system thinker. And then you talk to them, and it's like, wow, this guy is the worst system thinker I've met in a long time. This guy has no idea about systems at all. So authentic system thinking to me means that synthesis precedes analysis and the containing whole is appreciated. So synthesis is putting things together. Analysis is taking things apart. Now, if you're in a design program, this is the most interesting part of being in a design program, is designers put things together. You don't take things apart, generally. If you don't, if you're, if you don't put anything together, then you're not doing the work of a designer. Uh, but the idea that you should actually have synthesis preceding analysis, because systems includes both. We, we talk about part of whole, so you can take the system apart, but putting a system together as being the ultimate test of being a real system thinker is um, an interesting challenge in this kind of bar. So how do we do that? Number one, identify containing whole, which is another system, of the thing to be explained is a part. Okay, so um, Peter was late this morning, right? Okay, so we have a system which was Peter getting to, from home to the school. How should we think about that? Should we, you know, blame Peter because you know he's given up earlier and all sort of stuff? No, no, no. Let's do this the right way. Um, he actually sent a message that there was an accident or something that happened on the way. So it's not about Peter. It's about the containing hole. It's about the transit system in Toronto. So um, he got stuck. So the containing bowl system, the thing to be explained in part. The usual way I describe this, and we think if we think about the bus. And my general rule is when you get on the bus, do not yell at the bus driver. If it's late, it's not his fault. He's just driving the bus in traffic. Well, who do you blame then if you don't blame the bus driver? Okay, well, you could blame the city because they haven't done the city planning correctly. You could blame the province because they haven't provided enough, uh, enough funding. Uh, you could blame, you could actually blame the union if you want. The union has work rules. Uh, you could blame uh, whoever is manufacturing these vehicles. Bombardier hasn't been doing too well recently on delivering stuff. Mm -hmm. So these are all containing holes. So when you're looking at a system, there are multiple containing holes. Well, which one are you working on? Well, okay, when you're looking at a system, there are multiple containing holes, and you have to look at all of them, and that's part of the mess. Because you're working at all the containing holes. You thought it was great, like, you know, so, so Tim Allen was saying, okay, you know, work in the context of the ecology. Oh, what's the context of the ecology? It's a containing hole. What's a containing hole in the ecology? Oh, geez, okay, you got it. You know, you're trying to save a lake, well, the lake has the water around it, it's got people, you know, it's, it's got uh, moths around it. There's, there's a lot of containing holes that can happen. Okay, explain the behavior of the properties of containing hole. So going back to our PTC example, 
So let's say the containing whole is uh, the profits. Well, what is the um, behavior of property in the containing whole? Where is transportation ranked in the, in the province? Well, what are the two big funding things that the province does? They do education and they do healthcare. Those are the two big ones, right? The transportation is not really the biggest thing. Now, it would be nice if they had more funding for transportation, but are you willing to accept less funding for schools or less funding for um, healthcare so you give up your transportation? So there's the behavior of the containing whole. They're giving you the money that they think that you know that should be distributed, given all the other things they have to worry about. Explain the behavior of property the thing to be explained in terms of role or function of the containing whole. Okay, so now we're actually looking at how the uh, the, the bus works within the province of Ontario. Well, it's part of a transportation system, and so uh, there are other things in the transportation system. There are cars, there are bicycles, there are you know, walk. So there's multiple things going on here. So you can see how taking this approach when you're doing system thinking, you're not yelling at the bus driver anymore. You're not the bus driver's fault. You're doing your job. Acoff, being a, having written a dissertation called On Purposeful Systems, creates this categorization of types of models for systems. So the first one is deterministic. Uh, the part, so we have this idea of, of purpose of purposive and purposeful, which I'll get to. So the purposeful of ideal seeking. You're seeking an end. So a uh, deterministic system, the parts are not purposeful and the whole is not purposeful. So if you have a uh, carburetor in a automobile, the carburetor doesn't choose to be a carburetor and the car doesn't choose to be a car. In an animated system, the parts are not purposeful, the whole is purposeful. In the human body, the heart doesn't choose to be a heart. However, you as an individual choose, you have free will. Now you get into this interesting discussion of what animated, because now we can go down to talking about, okay, animals. Animals have hearts, and so they don't have purpose, but animals make choice, well they make decisions. Okay, so why is it animated? Well, you get down to plants now. Do plants have parts? Yes, plants have parts. Do plants have purpose? Do they choose? And philosophically, that's been a debate. But trees, trees don't get to move. They don't get to choose which direction they're going to grow. They respond to sunlight. But they don't choose. They don't have will, per se. And so that's considered not purposeful. In a social system of human beings, uh, actually, you can do this for ants, too. but. Uh, the parts have purpose, so each of us as individuals have a purpose, and the whole, we as a society have a purpose. And that's what usually what causes a lot of conflict, is that you're trying to balance off one versus the other. What is the choices that we get as individuals, and what are the choices we get as a group? And then ecological, and um, now we get into trying to really understand what the, problem, what the term ecological means. Having purpose in the parts, but not purpose in the whole. So you could take the Earth. The Earth doesn't have a purpose, but we live on the Earth and we have purposes. Or you could take financial markets. So you may well manipulate one stock. It's really hard to manipulate the whole stock market. It doesn't have a direction. Let's clean up on definitions a little bit. Um, there's a difference between the word purposive, which is goal seeking, and purposeful, which is ideal seeking. <coughs> so. Uh, Acoff de defines this pretty clearly, which is not the way most people use these terms, but he does it right quite clearly, so I like this. Goals are ends that you can expect to achieve within a period covered by planning. So if you have a one-year plan, you have a goal. If you have a goal, within one year you're going to make something. An objective, ends that we do not expect to attain within the period plan. So within one year, we have an end that we want to achieve, but which we hope to achieve later. So. If we have a one-year planning cycle, we have an objective that we may achieve in five or ten years, but we're not going to do it in a year. It's worth pursuing. And then you have ideals, those ends that are believed to be unattainable, but towards which we believe progress is possible during and after the period plans for. So now you're into ideal beauty, ideal justice, ideal morality. There are ideals. It's unattainable. 
if you look in, in, those, in those ideals, if you actually achieve an ideal, it's actually setting your standard too low. It probably was a goal as opposed to an ideal. But that defines what purposeful means when you're looking at these types of systems. So next time you think about ecology and using that term, this is one of the uses of the word ecology that is helpful, that the parts have purpose, but the whole is not. There's, um, in long history, so there's, there's a community that's centered around um, systems thinking, system sciences now, that comes from more a biological um, ideal. Um, there was, this actually preceded by the cybernetics community that came out and, and uh, had a, uh, that they originally had what were called Macy conferences. And some of the people uh, in, in, well, in cybernetics is more a focus of control and communications between things. Uh, so this, the reason I'm bringing this up is um, you'll, you may hear the term someday, a first order cybernetics and second order cybernetics. And essentially, this is the idea about participating for facilitating. If you are in a first order cybernetics world, then you are outside the system and you can facilitate. If you are in a second order cybernetics world, you are inside the system and you're participating. Um, initially, when they're working on the idea of systems, you would have the idea that things could be objective and, you know, talk about machines and things like that. Um, but then the question was, does the person working with the machine influence the whole system? Well, it depends, depends how you define the system. So you get with second order cybernetics. So there are different uh, definitions here. Uh, Stuart Uppleby is a professor at uh, George Washington University, retired now. Um, but you have the difference between them, the cybernetics of the observed system versus the needs Cybernetics of observing the system. So when you're participating in the system, it's different from being outside the system. Um, that's from Von Furster, who's one of the uh, original people working in cybernetics. Uh, Gordon Pass, with the communications theory, talked about the purpose of the model as well as the purpose of the modeler. Uh, Varela, who worked in, um, in biology and cognition, talked about controlled systems versus autonomous systems. Um, Uppleby talks about interaction among the variables in a system as opposed to between the observer and the observed. So being inside and outside. Uh, and also he's recently working on theories of social systems where it, it attends, he's looking at, um, in effect, can we have a science 2.0 where the scientists are inside the system as opposed to being outside the system. This doesn't mean that um, first order is good, is bad and second order is good. These are actually different perspectives and different paradigms. Um, but as it, uh, with the acquiring system, where you saw some were, the first two were objective and the second two were subjective, you get the same sort of thing happening here, where you have the objective in the first order of cybernetics. So you, if it's objective, then you can be outside the system and you can act as a facilitator. Um, if you're inside the system, then um, you are anticipating and you have to um, approach it differently. Uh, I'm going to run across some quick a series of ideas, collapse, resilience, sustainability, and regeneration, just to give you an understanding. Um, collapse is an interesting term because when we talk about systems, everyone goes, oh, this system, you know, uh, this is a system, that's a system. But really, the test of a system is whether it continues to exist. And collapse is an interesting test. And so what's it mean for collapse? So we talk about... Uh, the fishing stocks in the Atlantic have collapsed. Well, what's that mean? That means that there are not enough, that we're overfishing, and there aren't enough young fish so that they can breed and produce more fish. So that's a collapse, so the system will die. So a collapse wreck, wreck displays a rapid and significant loss of social political complexity. Um, Joseph Tainter is uh, an expert on the fall of the Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire. And so the question is, why did the Roman Empire collapse? Well, it started off, every, all roads lead to Rome, and then it started conquering more and more and more and more, and as you get farther away from Rome, the power that the Roman soldiers had got less and less. And so you get to the point where they're so big that the system collapses because Rome can't control 
Britain and Norway and all those other countries from, from that distance. Um, second idea of resilience. I want to make the differentiation between engineering resilience and eco ecological resilience. Engineering resilience generally means return to the original state. So engineers say it was designed to, this car was, off, uh, was designed to run at, uh, at 100 kilometers an hour. And so all of a sudden it doesn't. Well, then resilience would be, well, how long does it take you to get back to 100 kilometers an hour? That was the original design point. Ecological resilience is a different idea because there's an idea of multiple stable states. Uh, when, when we have ecologists, when you go, I, I went to uh, uh, a uh, resilience conference, which is full of ecologists, biologists. It's pretty interesting to be around them. Uh, I came to understand when you have to look at research, ecologists love to study lakes. Why do they study lakes? It's because you, there's a lot of them around. And when you go to a lake, you can actually find one that's flourishing, but then you go over to the next lake, which is a mile away, and that, that one's dead. You know, there's no fish in it, you know, the algae over, the algae bloom, whatever. Um, so what's the difference? Well, there are multiple stable states. So it's not just like you're designing for a, an equilibrium. There are multiple equilibria. Equilibria is a, different, diff, a difficult term. Um, Generally, uh, systems people don't like to use the word equilibria, we prefer the term stable states. Uh, but if you think about lakes, there's a stable state where there's a flourishing stable state, and there could be another one that's you know, what's called a poverty trap, where there's no way you can get it out of being dead. So uh, there's a flip associated with that. Uh, sustainability, uh, Tim Allen's definition of what, for whom, uh, for how long, at what cost. Um, and he's definitely managing the systemic context, I told it before. Uh, and then we also have the idea of regeneration. Um, Lyle is actually um, a uh, landscape ecologist. Uh, so we talk about plants generally. But it's interesting to think about regenerative systems. Because do we have a system that actually regenerates? that reproduces itself and, and is able to preclude the collapse. So all these terms are used in system thinking to various degrees, and they're pretty universal in talking about biology, talking about physics, talking about social systems, whatever you're talking about, ecologies. They're, they're all using the same language across all of them. Uh, let's skip that. Okay, uh, I talk about high gain systems and low gain systems. Uh, this is one of the most difficult ideas. Uh, if you don't get this, this is the one I tell people when I'm actually have a lot, a lot of time to teach it. Uh, this is one that you're going to get because I didn't understand what that meant, and then five years later you go back. I think I know what that meant. Um, the way that Tim Allen described this because he's a botanist is he talks in terms of ants. Uh, there are two types of ants. There are food gathering ants and there are fungus farmers. So uh, a food gathering ant goes and collects, you know, whatever nature provides. So everything's there. <coughs> a fungus farmer, <coughs> a fungus farmer, is actually um, an ant that works in dung. And so dung is a really low grade material. So why would you have some ants that are eating high grade, you know, proteins and stuff like that, other ones that are feeding on dung. And is that a good idea or a bad idea? So it turns out that you have this trade-off between um, complicated and complex. Okay. Um, a complex system is a high gain system. It is efficient. Um, the way I used to describe this, okay, let's, 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 let's talk about uh, an example where you own a pizzeria. A little takeout place. You have an oven. You have a driver. You know, deliver pizza. Okay, you're doing really well in pizzeria. You have the choice. What you can do is you can expand. There's two ways you can expand. One way would be, okay, we were a takeout place. We could become a full restaurant, and we could put a second floor on our pizzeria. 
That's a complex. The other way of looking at it is, is oh, you know, we've been really good at doing takeout, um, and you know, we cover the east side of Toronto. Why don't we get another pizza oven and another takeout place on the west side of Toronto? That's complicated. Because you're expanding and you have the opportunity to work across town. You know, I've got two pizza ovens and two drivers, as opposed to having a complex system of one pizza oven and upstairs and you know you're using the pizza oven more because now you, you know, now you're you have a restaurant, right? Okay, so what why is one a better idea than the other? So having one pizza oven, because it costs to keep a pizza oven needed, uh, having one pizza oven serve more people is more efficient. Right? However, what happens if business goes down? If business goes down and you have two pizza ovens, you guys close down one of the stores and go back to what you were at before. So the two pizza oven complicated solution is a low energy, low gain system. The pizza oven in a restaurant that you've expanded to is a high gain system. So you have a high gain system and you get into trouble, what do you do? Well, now you own a house and you have to pay the people. So even if you fired the waitress, you now have a two-story building you're not using. You're dragging around the idea of that. If you were really smart and you could see what was happening, what you would do is say, oh, I see a recession coming, and if we were actually like the old takeout place with one oven, we'd be fine. So what we would do now is demolish the second floor before it's too late. That is decomplexification. But you end up with a choice where you have high gain systems or low gain systems, and you know you want to work, you want to live in one or the other. And people, there are real benefits for living in a high gain system. So living in a city, the city of Toronto, yes. Go ahead. But what happens, for example, in, in, in that particular example, when he complexifies? takes so much toll in the original business, i.e. demolishing across the second floor. Like, is that taken into account too? Well, so, so if the, the problem is that if you, if you have the restaurant and you can't pay the taxes, you don't have a collapse. Because, so, Kapla uh, 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 Kaplanskis, right? That, that happened very rapidly. They expanded, um, they ran the problems, all of a sudden it rippled through, and a month later they're closed. So Kaplansky actually had a complicated structure and got into trouble. Uh, the complication could have been, if, he, if he'd done things right, he might have been, he had, he had a store on College Street and a store up on, uh, uh, up on uh, Yorkville. So could he have backed out of the Yorkville place? I don't know the contract he had. But I think that actually it was easier, easier for him to close the College Street place, but that would have been moving from a low gain system you have, you have a high gain system and a low gain system together combined into a complex, and you're trying to, you're trying to undo them, and the best solution may have been to actually go back to College Street, but maybe the other solution would have been close down College Street and go to Yorkville. But Yorkville wasn't making enough money because of the high gain system. Okay, so, so collapse is the alternative. Collapse is the alternative, and, th and this is the issue with systems, is can you be proactive reactive um, and actually recognize the system is going to collapse and then do something about it. So being Canadians, you can actually, what, I, I, it's interesting that, that in my career, I've actually done a lot of teaching outside of Canada uh, on systems thinking. Uh, I don't do that much in Canada. Um, and I figured out why, it's because in Canada the systems work. Um, the reason you need to learn system thinking is systems don't work. Uh, so, um, a system that works, exactly, for example, a uh, Canadian pension plan. So, Canadian pension plan, they worked out like 15, 20 years ago that if they didn't change the way the pension contributions were done, they were going to collapse. So, they did. And at the time, there was a mining skirmish. But I think probably when you retire, the Canadian pension plan will have some money. Uh, more of collapsed. I think that's pretty good because Canadians are pretty good at doing that sort of stuff. But there are other systems where the collapse has happened. So um, reading, reading articles about Sears, 
So Sears Canada, when it closed, they took so much of the resources out of it that there was not, not enough, um, and the company in fact collapsed, went bankrupt, didn't, didn't exist. So this is what I kind of told you before, um, and more formally, which is collect, um, complexity is an elaboration of organization, which is vertical, and co complicated is elaboration of structure, which is horizontal. So if you are expanding a system, we're doing the pizza thing, you can create more of the same, which is complicated, or you can create a complex where you have a deep hierarchy. So do you want complex or do you want complicated? It's a choice. You don't have, there's no right answer here. <laughs> if you want it complicated, everyone would not be living in the city of Toronto. Everyone would be living in small towns. So this is actually a problem we have in the city of Toronto. And, and one of the cases, and if you read Tim Allen's work, the problem that we have in cities is they are complex. And the reason people move to the cities is they have better services than you have in towns. I was born in Greenhurst, so I've lived in small towns. And I understand what happens there. Um, you rely on neighbors more, right? Because, you know, you have, in Greenhurst, you have a volunteer fire department. You can't have a volunteer fire department in Toronto. Matter of fact, in, in Greenhurst, I remember, we have amateur theater. Like, amateur theater in Toronto, it's like, geez, everyone's an actor, a professional here. How can you be an amateur theater if we've got theater companies all professional? So, Low gain systems, the high gain systems don't work the same way. If we were trying to be sustainable, because um, the, the, the problem and, and the way that Tim Allen works on this is supply side sustainability, is he looks at marginal benefit versus marginal revenue, and in fact, the marginal benefit versus marginal cost, like economic type of answer. And what happens is that if you were a business, you would kind of work to marginal cost equals marginal benefit, and one learns that in kind of economics 100. But what happens? is that when you're um, working in a system like a city of Toronto, you, everyone comes until the marginal benefit is zero, which is way past the marginal cost. So there are more people in complex systems than there should be. And it's a rational thing to do because we have better services in Toronto. But then you've got congestion. So the uh, uh, interesting question to me is always, how long would the city last if we had a uh, had a major catastrophe like a uh, EMP? Uh, so we have a bomb, and all of a sudden, you know, all the food is shut off from the city. Toronto is unsustainable. We wouldn't last more than a couple of days. We, you know, everyone would have to leave the city because there's no food here. If you actually look at Waterloo, Waterloo and uh, Kitchener are in a sustainable area because they have farms around them, and you know, people don't people grow their own things, and they would last a little bit longer. Not many people in Toronto have their own chickens or their own eggs. That's changing. <laughs> hmm? That's changing. They just started to allow hens in the city as a test. Yeah, yeah. So an another another high gain system, low gain system example, uh, complex, complicated. Uh, electrical power. So everyone could potentially have their own solar panel, but it's much easier for us to just rely on Toronto Hydro. I know if the bills keep going up, maybe that might happen. But if you also look at the design of uh, computer systems, so the internet is actually designed as a complicated system. The original internet was, if you were on the internet, you would transmit data that was coming from one place from another place. It would be routed. Um, in the original internet, every node was equal. So if you were on the internet, you had no idea what, what traffic was going through your computer because it would actually route things. And it was designed that way because they were scared of having a uh, nuclear attack someday, and so you want to the internet. But today, we have the internet backbone. And you put a backbone in the system, oh, it's a complex system. So the backbone is faster, but then when the backbone goes down, you're in trouble. Yeah. So when you're talking about behavior getting simpler, 
versus more complicated. Are you referring to the behavior of the system or behavior of the individuals in the system? I'm talking about the, the system. Now now you get down to defining which yeah. system you're talking about. Well, okay, so I would imagine in a complex system uh, that as hierarchy gets deeper, you get increased specialization. Mm -hmm. And so the individuals may have a simpler set of skills that they, well, deeper, less broad set of skills that they need, mm -hmm. whereas someone in a complicated system would need to be Most a generalist. Skill. Generalist, yes. But that's separate from the behavior of the system itself. Um, again, it defines how you, it depends how you define a system. So let, let's do a little history here. I mean, not old, and not everybody's not old enough. There used to be the city of Toronto and the boroughs. Yeah. And then we have Vegas City, right? So which one is better, which one is worse? Well, in, when, we were, when we had the boroughs, um, in Toronto we used to get garbage picked up twice a week, and uh, we had to shovel the snow off our own walk. In North York they had garbage picked up once a week, but they had um, snow plows taking the windows out. And so when everyone is in the mega city, everyone gets a saying, which is the, the lowest common denominator. We all get one once a week garbage picked up, and we, none of us get our wind roads now done. So if you're in a complicated system, you could have localization. If you're in a complex system, no, everyone has to be treated the same. It's a choice. This is, is a design point. Okay, so we covered parts, holes, and their relations. Everyone's kind of got that. Oh, do we talk about whole whole relations or not enough? The whole whole relations, when we're talking about complicated systems, they're holes. So talking about a group of towns together, that would be whole whole relations. Uh, so talk about systems before analysis. We talk about first order cybernetics, second order cybernetics. We have the idea of high gain and efficiency, and low gain and sustainability, and the idea of Decomplicating and decomplexifying. I haven't used the word simple because it's not a meaningful term here. Because the sim simplicity is associated with complexity. Because what you do is that you create something that's a black box and then it becomes simple. So, you know, do you need to know how to drive a car when someone else is driving an Uber? Well, that's a complex, Uber is a really complex system. The complicated system is, oh, you get a driver's license and you learn how to do that yourself. Okay? Do it not too badly. Okay, we're going to tackle the idea of unfreeze, change freeze uh, versus um, a co-responsive movement. Um, so, uh, we may take a break in the middle of this, or towards the end. Um, I'm going to talk about disruptive innovation theory, um, and uh, the book I launched last week was called Open Innovation Learning. If you go to openinnovationlearning.com, uh, the book is available open access, which means it's free. There's a PDF version, and there is a uh, EPUB version. So you can go to Kobo, and you can actually sign up. The best way to do it is actually go to Kobo, sign up at Kobo, and download it from Kobo for free, uh, because it's on the Kobo catalog. Uh, but a lot of the stuff I'm having, uh, I'll give you kind of a, a little preview of some of the stuff I've got from there. Uh, we'll go back into the heritage of Tavistock with uh, social psychological, social technical, and social ecological perspective, which led to what's called the cause of texture theory. We'll talk about pacing layers of change, and then we'll talk about um, dynamic stability model, uh, where you get the mass customization. So this idea, how many have heard the idea when you do organizational change, you do un you do unfreeze, change, and freeze? Heard that? No? Okay, so when you're if you're working in a company and you have someone coming in and <coughs> advising on the organization development, how you do your organization, generally they think what you should be doing is unfreezing the organization because you have this culture and people are working in a certain way. Uh, if you go back to uh, uh, Kurt Levine in 1947, he was actually looking at the issue of uh, teenagers juvenile delinquents. Okay, so how are you going to change a juvenile delinquent? Okay, well, you kind of need to un unfreeze them because they used to work in a behavior a certain way, change them, and then 
freeze them again. So Army does this. You go to boot camp. What are they doing in boot camp? Is when you come into the Army, you have all your individual quirks and behaviors. They unfreeze you. They break you down. They change you the way that you want, and then everyone behaves the same way afterwards. Okay. Now it turns out when you actually do the investigation of this, um, essentially, it turns out that Levine actually didn't do the work, um, didn't create this term of of uh, unfreeze, change, and freeze. He actually did the unfreeze part. But then over the next 30 years, um, people doing organization design work came across the idea. But essentially, the idea that uh, is important here is the idea that you're coming to a stable state. So you're in one stable state, you're changing, and you're going to another stable state. And it could, that, that's, that change in stable state could be because the system collapses. It could be because you're proactive enough to you decide you're going to reorganize the system. But in effect, you have this idea of stable states. So is there a stable state? Maybe, maybe not. Has anyone read The Innovator's Dilemma? Peyton Christensen? Bestseller of the past, uh, old now. Uh, came out in 1997, within 10 years. Um, Clayton Christensen, um, his original thesis was on uh, disk drives in Silicon Valley. So you had manufacturers creating five and a quarter inch disk drives, uh, and they're doing really well at them. And disk drives being what they are, every year they're increasing the density, they're increasing the performance of reliability. And then the opportunity came along for three and a half inch drives. Okay, you've got a dilemma now because you have a three and a half inch drive, it's smaller, but it's actually less reliable and stores less data than a five and quarter inch drive. So you have this choice. You can actually serve the customers you had, the old customers, or you can actually give up the old customers and say, I'm going to go on this new technology that's less reliable and costs more and it's good for you though. And so that's why I called the innovative dilemma. Um, in this case, when he's doing, looking at this, because of the investment involved, you could either do one or the other, you really can't do both. And so in order for you to make that transition, you can either stay with this one stable state, or you can look at another stable state. Now this is pretty well the traditional way you would look at innovation, which is innovation as a single point, which I'm going to do an innovation and then we'll be, we'll be done, right? A, uh, a unfreeze, freeze, um, unfreeze, change, freeze idea coming up. Uh, now IBM around 2006, there's an idea that the nature of innovation had changed. Uh, and it was, I was working for IBM, I worked for IBM for 28 years, and so I was claiming around 2006 that we all had a mantra, which the nature of innovation is now this open, collaborative, multidisciplinary, and global. Okay, well that's great, but what's it mean then? What's that really mean? Because I don't know what it was. So let's look at it this way. So in the industrial age, strategy was private. So if you were going to do R&D, you would do it as a private project. IBM had IBM Research, Bell had Bell Labs, all these type of companies, um, Xerox Park. They were all privately owned. Uh, in the 21st century, there's a lot of movement towards open standards. So now, everyone knows what GitHub is? GitHub, yes? Okay. So GitHub is not a foreign idea. It was 10 years ago. The idea that you actually would share your code openly and people could download it and share it. Wow, pretty interesting. Um, in the industrial age, the relationships are very much transactional, where you had a produ production chain. And when you say production chain, it's usually product flowing one direction, and you try to optimize that. Whereas the collaborative means now you have alliances co-producing accelerated learning. What's important is the learning. It's not so much the product. You're actually having collaboration, and it's not clear who's doing what. It's a collaboration together. The methods have changed from analytical problem solving, and now you kind of understand what we're talking about when we say problem, maybe not messes, to multidisciplinary conversations where we are trying to deal with messes. And the economics before were colonial trade uh, versus global talent. So innovation is no longer an industrial age thing where you 
It's like, well, you know, we have this year's model of car, and the next year we have a new model of car, and we're always doing this one year period where we do a production of a vehicle, and then uh, we unfreeze, we reorganize the plant, we freeze, and then we build another automobile, different model. We're actually doing stuff continuously, we're changing. So if we're gonna do this, now we need a change in philosophy. Um, this is actually a 2017 article uh, that's in the Royal Anthropological Institute. For those of you who are fans of uh, YouTube and uh, learning on YouTube, you should search for Tim Ingold. Uh, he's all over the um, YouTube. He's a really great speaker. What he does, he actually does speeches and then writes them up into articles. Sometimes he doesn't listen to them. Uh, he's great if you have if you download it onto, uh, onto your phone and then uh, go bicycling or driving or something. Uh, so this is actually an article that I think he gave a speech in 2015, but uh, it got print, uh, published in 2017. And so the way he thinks about systems, now, we were talking about systems before, and I was talking about, about process as arrangement in time, structure as arrangement in place. Let's take that shift and let's move from thinking about, about place or thinking about time. And so what we're doing now is looking at um, human lifelines. Uh, the idea behind lifelines is that when you draw a system, conventionally the way people draw systems, they draw a circle, and you know everything that's inside the system is you know, inside the circle, and they have the environment outside. Well, Tim Ingold says, well, maybe we should be looking at this a different way. Let's not look at systems that way. Let's look at a system as a line. As a line that progresses over time. So my system over time is I have my life goes one direction. I do various things, and you each all, each of you has a line. Now, as we progress, we form a knot because we come together, and we're together for this point, and we have a knot where we actually have another system that's operating with us all in. Corresponding, what's called corresponding, so we're, we're dealing with each other. So, if we do this change in, in thinking, so what does it mean to correspond? There's three ideas. One is that we deal in terms of habit as opposed to volition. So, when we, the example he talks about quite often is walking. Okay? So, if we are walking, are you walking? Like, do you actually think about every step, or is the walking walking you? Are your legs walking you, or are you walking your legs? Um, agency rather than agency. We're looking at interaction and corresponding. And in this case, this, and this is the reason that, that this is actually valuable for looking at service systems, is that we're now talking about interactions between parties. You have multiple parties, and so we're each on our own lifelines, our own lines, and we intersect, and we correspond, and we do that actively. So it's not enough for me to plan for my lifeline. I have to plan for your lifeline for at least the period that we're together, or accommodating while we're there, take an eight same position. And also, we deal with intentionality rather than intentionality. Uh, there's an interesting, I don't think I have a slide here. Okay. Uh, there's an interesting discussion about uh, the maze versus the labyrinth. A maze is a multi cursal puzzle. There are multiple ways into a maze, and there are multiple ways out of a maze. So that's the challenge. A labyrinth is a unicursal puzzle. There is one way into a labyrinth, and there's one way out of a labyrinth. You should try this over at uh, Trinity, um, uh, Trinity Square. There's a labyrinth on the ground there. And Hyde Park. Yeah, they went over there. Yeah, yeah. And so, why are labyrinths interesting? So if you actually go back to the, the old stories about, about uh, the labyrinth uh, and the red thread, when you get into the labyrinth, it's being interested in what's around you. So, you know, it's kind of like going to an art gallery. It's like, well, you know, you've seen the art before, then why, is, why would you go out to an art gallery more than once? It's not challenging. You can walk to the art gallery. Well, because you're paying attention to different things. Even if you're going to see the same painting, you're paying attention 
different things every time you go. So this has been influencing the way I've been looking at um, systems thinking for um, for the past two years, three years. And if you look at the way this works in the system literature, um, the, the, there's one way of looking at it, which is uh, through purpose. This is not a purposeful approach. Um, this is closer to Gregory Bateson's approach um, when you're looking at, uh, at learning of life. So are you coming up to a place where you could uh, have a transition to a break and then yes. pick it up again? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The last parts of it. Yeah. yeah. So um, going through the tradition of, of uh, systems, going through various approaches, uh, the Tavistock Institute was the one that uh, came out of World War II uh, and came up with these ideas of socio psychological systems, socio technical systems, and socio ecological systems. There's actually three volumes that were published. Uh, initially, the Tavistock Institute was focused on the social, uh, on the socio-psychological, which was having, um, having soldiers come back from war and readapt into society. Okay, so socio-psychological, one way would be, well, okay, the problem is the soldiers. We need to get the soldiers to adapt to the society. The other way of approaching it would be, the society needs to adapt to the way soldiers are when they return. The, a different approach we do socio-psychological. Socio-technical originally was done on the work of uh, coal miners when they were moving and they started to mechanize. So originally they went in with uh, shovels and uh, manual labor and, and simple machines to having machines that would take down entire walls. So all of a sudden now you have men and machine working together and trying to figure out how to design those systems. And the socio-ecological happened because of rapid change. When you have things that are changing so rapidly, you can't actually predict them. So the word ecology here is consistent with the word ecology I used before with uh, Akoff and Garage Doggy's definition. We're talking about parts and holes. You get purpose. So the, the paper, um, Emory and Trist, 1969, and we've talked about open systems. And we think about systems and their environment, so now we go back to the traditional view of, of systems. We can have a system, and if we think about how a system works, you can have the interaction between the system and its um, environment, which is planning. You can have the interaction between the environment and system, which is learning from the environment. So you're living, working in the system, working in the environment, and you make changes. And that's how system changes the environment. But there's also the ideas of inside the system, there are changes that happening inside the system, and outside the system, there are changes that happening in the environment that have nothing to do with the system we're talking about. So there's all these perspectives on types of systems. Um, this comes back to an old article by Sommerhoff, which is um, it's really hard to read, and so I actually started drawing it out. The, it, it's a, it, in essence, he uses this metaphor of playing uh, soccer, playing football. And the net is that there's two ways of playing football. One is you go to the ball. The other one is you wait for the ball to come to you. That's, that's the article. After reading it for like three days, I figured out that's, that's, <laughs> that's what it means. But you can see the idea inside, of, inside this idea of systems. So if we go to now the type of change you would have, you have the causal texture of social environments. Um, and there are four types of, of uh, environments you can work in. Um, and the way he usually describes this, imagine you have a surface, you have little critters on the surface, and uh, you have food. So in the first type, you have what's called a, uh, a random class environment. You have food everywhere, and you have critters everywhere. So it's the, you just kind of, you know, you eat. There's no problem. Everyone has enough. The second one, clustered placid. What happens now is that you have food, but it's in little clumps. And so when you run out of food, you move. Simple rule. Before it was food is everywhere, now you have food, you move. Disturbed reactive, now you've got competition. So you have food in clumps and 
you have multiple critters. So what's the rule? Move for food. If there's someone there, go somewhere else because there's enough food. The last case is a turbulent environment. Now you've got an earthquake. The ground is shaking. The food is all over the place. You're not even worried about food anymore because you're trying to survive. And the world's in change. So when we're talking about change, it's not just about change itself. It's a type of change that you're looking at. Because we are talking before about the idea of unfreeze, change, and freeze. You can't very well do that in a turbulent environment because there's nothing stable. Uh, let's see where I am. Okay. Let's take a break because I'm at the point where I'm going to talk about stuff in my book, and we can leave that for a while.